guys, it's Mark from the Santana, and you're listening to Torrent This with Dando. Hey guys, Dando here for Torrent This Radio. Now, I am joined on the line by a man who's band released their critically acclaimed debut album, History of Houses, late last year, which contains the new single, King River, and they're set to play in Melbourne this Friday night, October 25th, at the ESPY. I'm, of course, talking about the Siren Tower, and I'm lucky to be joined by the guitarist, Mark. Mark, thanks for your time, mate. How you doing? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm always good. What's been happening today? Oh, today, man. Just another another busy day of uh, organizing and getting prepared for the tour, really. Mm. It's always, always last-minute preparations of making sure you've actually booked the right flight and you actually have gear to play on on the other side of the country, so making sure it's all in order. Have you ever like booked the wrong flight or forgotten something? Like You got to the airport and thought, shit, I knew I'd leave that behind. <laughs> um, luckily not. We generally, sort of, I generally book all the logistics and I'm pretty anal about that stuff, so nothing too major yet, but um, you know, you're always traveling way lighter than you'd like to be, so... You'd like to bring about ten times more gear than you actually can. So <laughs> it's all it's all down to how much you can Tetris things into the smallest places, and how little gear you can actually run on. For, so, but uh, you know, I enjoy the challenge. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you a good Tetris player? I am the Tetris player in the band. Yes. When it comes to uh, to the van, we've done enough tours now that um, I think the other guys know that I'm probably going to be just missed if I don't get to pack it in the right way. I'm one of those really annoying guys who's, you know, just wants to make sure that it actually gets in. Cause, yeah. You know, six guys traveling around in a 12-seater and half of that's gear. Um, you want to make the ride a little more comfortable rather than have to sit on top of pretty uh, sharp objects. If you had to sit on one of the other guys' laps, who would it be? <laughs> um, wow. Wow. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess Grant's the biggest guy, so I guess, you know, if you're talking about someone being akin to maybe like a big lazy boy chair, maybe he's, he's going to offer the most real estate. Yeah, um, comfortable like a teddy bear. <laughs> Brody's probably going to be, yeah, packing the extra pillows. So, <laughs> you know, maybe he's, he's going to be pretty comfortable too, but... Odd question, my friend. Yes, yes. I don't like it. Yes, so um, <laughs> you, I'm assuming you guys aren't in Tassie yet then? No, no. So we um, we fly out uh, very late on Wednesday night, catch the, the good old red eye into Tassie, um, and we've got a show that night at the Republic Bar, so that's when it all sort of kicks off. Yeah. Well, what's usually like your main focus going into a tour, besides making sure you don't forget shit? Um, I guess the main focus is, is making sure that we're actually getting to see as many people on the tour as possible, you know, especially touring from, from a city like Perth in Australia, it is, um, a much further distance to go. Um, and you are sort of restricted on what you can bring as I was saying. So it's mainly just making sure it's worthwhile, basically making sure that you're sort of getting the exposure of the shows really early on, talking to good people like yourself, um, talking to press, um, actually making it happen because, you know, I suppose every musician's been in a situation where, you know, you just, you start out and you're really fresh and you just go play a show and your only focus is, you know, oh, I need to remember how to play the songs and make sure I play them well. And that's obviously a focus for us, but uh, luckily we've been doing this a little while, so now the focus shifts to making sure the actual show as a whole logistically goes well and we just get to to meet some cool people and have some good chats with people who come down and that's sort of where you get the enjoyment from, I guess. Yeah. Well, you're also playing a show in Melbourne Friday night at the ESPY. This one's a free show. Then there isn't a gig for like almost a week. Are you guys staying around in Melbourne for a few days or something? Or? Um, after the Melbourne show, we, uh, we are probably the biggest fans of the ESPY. Okay. Um, that you'll find in the country. We've um, we've probably played there, so this will be maybe the fifth time back. We just can't get enough of the place, can't get enough of the good people of Melbourne, and sort of kicking on afterwards with a few good peeps. But um, yeah, this will be um, sort of. Let me think. After the Melbourne show, um, we'll actually be heading back to Perth a couple of days later because um, you know we do have day jobs and things like that as well. <laughs> yeah. and, um, that, that's that's the other challenge of of Perth is. Um, you know, to sort of have five or six people just hanging out 
on the other side of the country when you don't have shows on is um, not really the best idea sometimes. It sort of changes from tour to tour just depending on, you know, whether you're doing anything in between mm. apart from shows. But um, we'll be heading back here for a few days, keep working in the studio, keep working day jobs, and then pop back over to Sydney and Brisbane on the next weekend. Like, so you sort of, you break it up and you sort of fly back and forth a few times, which seems like a crazy idea and uh, it probably is but that's kind of how you have to do it is it like going back to a day job halfway through a tour does that sort of kill the vibe of a tour <laughs> um yes uh, in, in a way you know it is you do want to sort of just live the dream and stay in the moment and sort of you know basically hang out and play music but um i suppose i'm lucky myself and uh brody is a two brody the drummer we we co-own a recording studio here in Perth, and that's cool. basically our day jobs, seven days a week. So when we're not playing music um, and writing music and recording music with the Siren Tower, we're basically playing music, writing music, and recording music with everyone else in Perth. So we we pretty much don't do anything else, okay. um, which which is a, which is a real luxury. Um, but uh, let's just say we don't get too many days off from music. <laughs> <laughs> living the dream, though. Living the dream. Yeah, it's it's good. It's a challenge. It's always a challenge. But uh, I have to say, I'm a pretty fortunate person to be able to do that in seven days a week. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's been like a year now since the album was released. Do you, do you feel like a need to get another one out soon, or are you guys just taking it easy for a while? I guess I guess we're big believers um, in the sort of classic idea of the album. I mean. In this day and age in the music industry, it is there's much more of a push to get things out a lot sooner. Mm. There's a, a lot more focus on maybe doing singles rather than albums. You know, uh, you can get a lot of mileage out of just a single song, and you know, a lot of the major labels and major artists are just riding on on single song releases. But being the sort of I suppose more folk orientated sort of songwriting narrative band that we are, we we really think that needs to be showcased in an album environment, and so. Basically, you know, an album cycle can last, you know, two or three years from the time of writing and recording it to sort of having it out there and, and touring on a few singles. So we are getting a little antsy to, to get back in the studio. We're already sort of writing new material for the next one now, but uh, we're not exactly rushing it, yeah. to say. Well, like, it's funny because like you were saying, I read a lot of press now online. They sort of say, oh, it's been so long since the last album, not just for you guys, but like, for other bands when it's only been like a two, three year gap. And I'm thinking, shit, guys, like, give them a break. They've got to make the music first. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, there's a lot of sort of pressure which comes with that. But I mean, you can sort of fall victim to going, oh, wow, we just, you know, read something that says, you know, we're falling off the perch because we haven't released something in 18 months. But uh <laughs> You know, I think that's always going to be um, just something you accept, you know, because from a, I suppose, a music listener's point of view, of which I am an avid music listener, you do, you know, want to discover a band and, and you get into something from them and then you sort of, you can exhaust that pretty quickly. I, mean, I mm. don't know about yourself, but if I if I come across something new, which I dig, I'll, I'll just listen to it intensely for a couple yeah. of weeks and just can't get enough. Exactly the same. <laughs> and then I suppose from that angle, you want, you want something more. So I guess that's why we like to get out and tour as much as we can and release as many video clips and things like that because, you know, we do want to have something to offer people who are kind of into what we do, but it is a challenge, but I don't think you can really rush these things because we'd never compromise on, you know, what we actually want to present to people just to get it out sooner. Yeah. Well, you you guys, you you love to tell stories with your music. Do you feel that that makes it more difficult to write, like, than a standard three-minute pop or rock song? Um, it's a good question. I don't don't think it makes it more challenging, but, I mean, you can't really force a good story, I suppose, and uh, some of the the stories on this record have definitely come from from past times. I mean, Grant, um, the sort of principal songwriter and lyricist in the band, um, really does draw on his personal experience and sort of his surrounding. And, and um, for example, the current single King River mm. is very much based on where he grew up and, um, you know, having that idea of a home to come, come back to and seek refuge. And, uh, you know, those sort of things just don't pop out of nowhere. Um, so I guess taking the time to make sure those stories are told 
in the way that you want them to be perceived is very important. But whether that's harder or, or easier than maybe writing a catchy pop song, um, I guess it's hard to say. Music's one of those things, isn't it? It's just yeah. hard, hard to put a formula to any of this stuff. Yeah. Well, which musician do you think is the best storyteller, in your opinion? Worldwide? Yeah, past or present. Wow, wow. Um, I guess, from my personal taste, I'm, I'm always... I love a good narrative and I love a good story, but I guess I lean towards sort of slightly more eclectic lyrics rather than literal stuff, which I think Grant does very well in this band. But, um, you know, even just to, to speak of some recent things, you know, like I was saying, stuff I'm obsessing and digging, I've always been a massive Paul Dempsey fan mm -hmm. of the way he can tell a story and paint a picture with with very sort of with a different vocabulary uh, I guess than a lot of the stuff you hear but um, I can't deny that I'm a huge you know 60s music fan either and, and there were some great you know narrative singer songwriters of that era you know you just pick any of the big names I mean, I'm, a, I'm a Beatles boy L L Lennon's my man Lennon's, Lennon's your bag I, I, yeah. I have his signature uh, tattooed on my forearm <laughs> Wow. Was that something he signed for you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're the first person that's made that joke. No. <laughs> I know, I know. A really original, hey? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. It's good because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I probably can face, you know, my earliest musical experiences, uh, you know, my mum force-feeding me Beatles when I was, you know, not even six months old driving around <laughs> in a car seat. You know, I was, I was fed that from a young age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very grateful for it too. Yeah. Well, um, the, the album cover art and packaging is pretty unique. It's in like the form of a hardcover scrapbook. Can you tell everyone just a little bit more about it? Yeah, this was... Um, I suppose I can start out by saying it was a bit of a gamble. Yeah. Because um, I guess in this... Like, going back to what we were talking about before, sort of there's such a push these days for, for digital music distribution. And I'm a big fan of it, to be honest. I, I sort of embrace the new technologies that are coming out but we knew that you know we wanted with this style of band to to do something hard copy that people can kind of take home and and find interest in so we've just figured if we're going to release a cd like a, a physical cd you can hold in this day and age it better be worth buying because you know it's really not the done thing anymore and cd sales are just dropping like flies but we basically went all right let's do something the most extravagant thing we can think of, make it worth these people actually sitting down and having a bit of a read through, through, I guess, the aesthetic of the album. So we got onto this idea really early of, of a history of houses. We came up with the title very early on. Mm. And um, basically, to put the packaging um, in a nutshell, it's a 64-page book-style sort of booklet or scrapbook so like today. <laughs> and uh, yeah... And um, it actually features pictures of all of our childhood houses and just a little sort of handwritten, I guess, description of what that meant to us at that particular moment in time. And I guess the ideas of stories um, is where that came from. Of, you know, each story is just linked to a moment, a definite moment in time. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of old pictures of our childhood houses. We included, you know, the lyrics and we're a big fan of, the classic liner notes that you used to get on, you know, LPs and stuff like that. Mm. Or vinyl, because you had the space. So we thought, let's do that as well. And let's actually try and give people a little bit of an insight into the background of the song. So each song has a little bit of a, a feature from one of the members on maybe how it was recorded or where the idea came from or what was going on at that point in time with the band. And uh, I guess once you start doing that for all the songs on the album and without including everything else, 64 pages comes up pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, we just we just went with it, and uh, we sort of managed to hook up with the company um, in the States via China. It was totally done internationally. We didn't even get to see a prototype before it was done. Jesus. So basically came down to it, you know, box after box rocked up uh, on our doorstep when we got the first pallet. And uh, I can tell you now it took us about... Oh, probably the better part of three days 
before anybody was game to open a box. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> we were just that scared, but it turned out just beautifully. We couldn't have asked for it to come out better, to be honest. But, 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 and, uh, we but, sort of believe that we're actually putting out something which is, you know, yeah. not just your average CD. Yeah, yeah. Well, besides yours, which which album packaging or cover art has impressed you the most in the past? Oh, gosh. Gosh. So it's a crazy day and age when you have to really struggle to think, all right, physical packaging, what does that look like? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a little bit of a vinyl, vinyl person. I actually just bought a few records the other day. I've always loved... This is going to be showing a side of myself more on the proggy side, but uh, King Crimson, I always loved in the Court of the Kings and Crimson, just that crazy face on the front of that record is just the most harrowing thing to look at. But uh, just a lot of its sort of 60s and 70s psychedelia, that sort of era and prog was just amazing for the artwork. I think I'm always going to think of, you know, large format stuff when you think artwork because it literally is the size of a picture in a painting and they just... They did so well to use that medium to make something really beautiful to look at. Yeah. But something, something along those lines, probably. Do you think a lot of artists, or the majority of artists these days, really give a shit about what the cover of their album looks like? Um, maybe not. <laughs> I suppose, that, like, not to get... Yeah, I'm not an authority on this by any means, but you really do notice it sort of shifted a lot more towards... Um, yeah, just the branding of the name rather than a, a beautiful piece of art, which totally makes sense, um, especially when you think the artworks are usually used not only for physical stuff but digital as well. So you basically just want a logo yeah. in a sense. Um, but yeah, maybe not. Um, I think it is slipping, and I guess, like I said, we're big believers in the album, so we'd like to try and keep that alive a little bit if we can. Hence why we've done a ridiculous looking booklet package. I don't have one, which, but I want one. <laughs> well, we'll have to sort you out with that, my friend. Yeah, yeah it's, definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, before I let you go, man, just a couple more quick questions. We're running out of time. Uh, where do you see yourself on both a personal level as well as the band in twelve months' time? Twelve months. Right. Cool. Okay. This this requires me to be organized, right? Okay. Which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. In a band, um, I think we would be uh, probably in the thick of, of the second album, to be honest, um, which is sort of at the stage now. I suppose these things take a long time. I mean, 12 months on a personal level seems like a long time away, but to be honest, on a band level, it's it's something you're always planning for. You're trying to sort of plan a year or two in advance because as we were talking, things like albums take a hell, heck of a lot of energy and time. Yeah. So we'll definitely be in the thick of album number two. What that's going to sound like and what it's going to be is uh, totally your guess is as good as mine at the stage. <laughs> but, um, uh, we're basically at the stages now of, of going through the million and one ideas that you know you have over the last sort of three years um, since sort of working on and completing the last one and, you know, everyone has little ideas and weird spoken word things and weird little musical things recorded on their phones and um, scribbled down on bits of paper and kind of just bring all these things together and start sifting through the madness and sort of cutting it down and going through that process to try and find a, a collection of workable things. Yeah. But, um... And personally, it's much the same. I mean, like I said, Brody and myself own a recording studio, and that's pretty much all we do. So our involvement in the band and the music industry and our jobs is is quite a fluid thing. There really is no difference. So um, I'm safe to say we'll probably be in a similar situation of making lots of music, uh, recording lots of music, and basically being active in the music industry, which... Uh, like I said before, I'm very fortunate to, to be able to say that I'm pretty happy with sort of where things are sitting. Yeah, you went the other way. Yeah. Well, what, what, what did you just say about the, the next album? You, you had a massive, gigantic booklet for this one. What's the next one going to be? A three D puzzle or something? <laughs> yeah, oh, that is that is probably going to be the thing that causes the nervous breakdowns. Is, is 
what do we do for the next one? We're probably just going to go the opposite way and make, you know, a matchbox or something. Do it. Maybe a matchbox with a USB stick in it. Yes. And we'll go as small as we possibly can. Yes, do that. <laughs> just, just to cover all bases. Yeah. Maybe each song on a matchstick, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, look, like each USB has one track. You have to buy 12 USBs. Yes. That yeah, would so not... I just collect the, collect the science out edition. Yeah, and you, you sell them at Safeway. You spend hundred bucks, you get a free USB with a track on it or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I don't even want to think about it. You're scaring me now. <laughs> all right, just one last question, mate. This is what I asked to everybody. It's uh, what advice do you have for all aspiring songwriters and musicians? Oh, how do you answer this question without sounding cliche? How do you do that? It doesn't. It's the impossible. Um, it's uh, yeah. Um, it's, we we're actually having this conversation the other night over a couple of beers, and um, we we're trying to sort of boil down to the fact with you know dealing with recording artists um, as a profession, but also being one of just how do you epitomize what should be important? And I guess it does come down to just being honest. And you know, I, I, I have been fortunate enough to deal with lots of genres, and you know, just last week in the studio, I'm recording you know some nights year old hardcore band who are just you know being as brutal as they possibly can (laughs) and it's honesty in that sense is exactly that you know they were sort of you know being like oh i don't know if you know this is a bit too out there or you know it was a really cute story actually but one of the guys was too too afraid to write fuck on his lyrics because he thought it would offend me oh really (laughs) as he was singing so things like that just being honest with the message you want you know if, if, if you want to tell the world to go fuck itself um, to put it lightly then do it you know but in the same sense if you're a singer songwriter just be honest with your message and be true to yourself I think especially in this day and age where I suppose there is still a lot of major label driven and I suppose advertising and media we're never going to escape that and it's necessary but uh, you need to decide whether you actually have something to say, how you want to say it, and then just go out there and say it to everyone and own that yeah. um, and be responsible for the message that you want to put out. Because yeah. um, if you're not being honest, it people can tell, um, especially with songwriting, people can tell when you're being contrived or trying to be someone that you're not. And I suppose no better than seeing it in a live sense. If you go and see a live gig, you know within the first five seconds whether the band on stage that you've come to watch is genuinely behind their message yep. or whether they're maybe, you know, just doing it because they think that's what they should do. So I'd probably say to anybody, just spend a bit of time literally sitting in a darkened room, staring at a wall, <laughs> thinking about who you want to be and what you want to say, and then just go and say it. Yeah, that's it. All right, guys. Well, there you go. Make sure you get yourselves a copy of the Siren Towers debut album, A History of Houses. Check them out the ESPY this Friday night and for the latest news and info. You can like them on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Siren Tower. Once again, Mark, thanks for your time, mate. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck with the tour, man. Thank you so much and thanks for the support. All, All right, the best, man. Catch you, man. Cheers.